and welcome back to Widowed AF. You're here with your host, Rosie Gilmoss. And joining me today, I have Louise Dodds. Welcome, Louise. Hi, thanks for having me. You're so welcome. Now, Louise is going to talk to us uh, about losing her partner, Andy. Um, You're also a sudden death widow, aren't you? So I will inevitably relate to a lot of your story, I suspect, particularly because it was a cycling accident. So these men and their sport, right? Um, And I'm assuming that there were repatriation issues as well, which um, must have caused you extra, extra difficulties. So, um, and I also wanted to mention that you are a very active member of Way, aren't you? You volunteer and you, you're a trustee. And I think people who turn their own pain into helping others are really good people. And I leaned heavily into Way when I was in the early days of my grief. And so from me and from anybody else who has gained support from Way, thank you for your contribution. But with that, I'm now going to ask you, Tell me your story. Tell me tell me in details rather than what I've just told everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, so Andy and I met in September of 2012. Um, I had lost my grandmother the year before and I'd kind of just been like dating around. I hadn't really been kind of serious. And after my grandmother died, I sort of I sat there and I was like, her and my granddad had been married for 56 years. I was like, that's what I want. I need to stop not messing around and you know you think about it mind yeah I was I was 20 26 and it was like I need to I need to do something and so I joined a couple of dating sites you know as 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 you do and oh yeah uh, yeah (laughs) where I I was I was coming home from I, I call it a mediocre date um and there was a message online from somebody um, and it was one of those kind of websites where they constructed like the first message for you. So just to break the ice type thing. Um, and there was I've a message there. Of that. That's quite sweet. Yeah. So it's like a like a pre-composed message that you mm. can send. And it just kind of rather than you stumbling through whatever you were going to try and say. And it makes it a little bit less awkward, I guess. Um, and I had a message on the Friday night, which I just kind of randomly replied to. And then on the Saturday morning, um, I'd had a reply from Andy and then we just started chatting. But through the day on the Saturday, we kind of like, we'd missed each other on and off offline. And then on the Saturday night, it just happened that we were both online at the same time. We started talking and at about six o'clock and then it was about 11 o'clock at night. And then we ended up on Skype until about two in the morning. And I was actually, oh, wow. I was actually at a christening the following day in the area where he lived, on like on the Sunday. So it was like after the christening, do you want to just meet up for a drink or a coffee or something? So I'd gone to this christening and I drove to this car park where we'd agreed to meet. And he'd obviously I'd, I'd learned a little bit about him. You know, he was a fan of a jazzy pair of shorts and some mismatched <laughs> socks, and even better a mismatched t-shirt. So nothing was cohesive. And then For anybody I just who's not was... watching this, I'm wearing a Mickey Mouse jumper right now. So not... I can relate to a bit of mismatched <laughs> outfits. <laughs> and I sat and I just remember sitting in the car park and I was like, you know, and you're like, oh my God, my makeup has been on all day. And I was just checking and freshening myself up. And then I just saw these Union Jack shorts in the rearview mirror <laughs> and these bright blue sunglasses. And I was like, that's him. So I got out of the car. And we went for a walk on the beach. We had an ice cream and you walked me back to the car. And that was pretty much first date and done. And it was really great. And we kind of never looked back. It was it was always a thing where people would say, you know, that we were always busy, always out and about and things. Um, part of when we first met about a month after we first met he was a competitive cyclist in his spare time so he raced for a team here in the northeast um so it was free it was often that he'd be out on the bike after work or on a weekend and this one weekend he had a race and him and his brother had gone down to um bushbork uh, bushborkland i think it was somewhere like that or 
to go for a bike race anyway. And then they they were cycling down. Then they were going to do the race. Whereas I'm like, if I had cycled down, that would have been enough for me. <laughs> but then I'm they were going very to... much with you. Yeah, but then they were going to do this this race. Um, and then I was just going to go down and pick him up afterwards because um, I was I had had like an appointment to get my hair done in the day, and I had gone down and I recognised somebody from one of the first races that I had been to and watched him, and Andy wasn't there, his brother wasn't there, N- nobody had seen him that hadn't started the race, and I was like, okay, hang on a minute, I had no signal, so I kind of drove back into like the nearest town. And finally got a signal and they'd had like a puncture in the tyre and he, Andy just been sat there waiting for me to appear and rescue him and bring him home because all he had was a, all he used to take out when he when he cycled was his phone, a fiver in cash and that was it just in case something happened to make a puncture repair kit. So I managed to find him and then brought him home but after only a month I was like and how worried I was at that time you know when you you know, when you know this person is someone and this person is special, like I knew from that moment, yeah. like this was going to be, this was different to anyone else. And then it's we had that you're that, that, that happened. Sorry. I've just over talked to you. I do apologize. No. Sorry. But it's just, it's ironic, isn't it? That that worry about him being on his bike made you realize how deep your feelings were for him. And yet it was yeah. that that ultimately killed him. Um, mm. Yeah, it's I, I'm I'm a big believer in falling fast and hard. I think you, when you fall, you 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 really fall. And um, yeah, I mean, you're telling me the most romantic story, and I wish I didn't know how it ended. Actually, <laughs> no. Um, and then it was I at the time I worked with young children. That was my profession at the time. He was also a, a teaching assistant, high level teaching assistant at the school. And after another few weeks, I just, I'd been picking up on little different things about the way that he acted, the way that he responded to things. And I was like, he's got Asperger's. This is our high functioning autism. I said, you know, this is, this. he's somewhere on the spectrum. I said, this is, mm-hmm. you know, this is something. And it was kind of clear to me that he didn't really know because he'd never mentioned it to me yeah. and he made comments about the staff that he worked with in the school maybe mentioning it to him like and joking about it and I thought about more about it and I was like no I said this is there's more to this so I had obviously doing in my background anyway being in in childcare so I was aware of what I was looking for I was aware of the different things and so I started to slowly make changes to our life to how we did things, what we did. So it would be like I would, I bought like a family calendar that Christmas. So I was able to put like, a, there was a column for him, there was a column for me, there was a column for his racing, which also appeals to my OCD and my my nice little organisational brain. <laughs> um, but I just started to introduce things and I started to watch, like we would go out with friends and you, you'd reach a point where I call it a social interaction limit where you could see he was done. Social batteries. Yeah, he was absolutely done. And so I would make the excuse and I would leave. And we would leave and he would go, but I, you didn't want to leave. I went, no, no, but you're ready to. And then it became a case of we looked at what we did. So, for example, on a Sunday, a typical Sunday for us would be we'd go, he'd go out to cycle. He'd meet me at my grandmother's house. I'd drive over there we'd get he'd get changed and we'd take my grandmother for lunch then we'd come back to her house and just he'd help her with a crossword then we'd go to see his nephews and his sister um and then when we got home because we'd been so busy I would then give him like a couple of hours while I was then prepping whether that was meal prep for the week for or shopping for the week you know making teas making pack lunches for the next day for work for both of us and then would come back together on a night time and just have like cheese and biscuits and watch like a box set or something. That was like our little Sunday routine. And I went off and I did some research about, um, you know, neurotypical people and neurodivergent people. And also I went off and I was, I spoke to people in forums and I was like, you know, did you see a benefit of getting an official diagnosis or do you feel, you know, what, what are the pros and cons? Can you give me any support and information? And then I, 
got a, a range of responses. But after about six months, I sort of sat them down and I went, right, this is, this is what I think. Here's all the literature. Here's all my research. Here's all the, the things that I think that are your kind of Traits. little, you know, trace that you do. Mm. And he read them and he was like, I agree. But then he burst into tears and he was crying. And I said, are you okay? And I said, I'm not doing this to upset you. I said, I, I just feel like you should know. And you're telling me that you find certain things difficult. I'm telling you why they're difficult and why I think they're difficult for you. And then he just went, goes, it's not, it's not that. He went, so is this it? I went, what? He went, are you leaving us? And I was like, no. Oh. I just think you might want to know. I said, I'm not bothered. I said, it doesn't oh, bother me. Love I'm here. Oh, oh, Louise, do you know what? You're making me um, well up a little bit over here and we haven't even got to this, the really sad bit. And the reason I'm feeling emotional is because I was late diagnosed. I, I It was gently suggested to me by my therapist um, that I might want to pursue a diagnosis initially of ADHD and then you know, there's an 80% crossover you know if you got one you probably got the other um so I then was diagnosed and for me it was it was integral to understanding who I was and yeah. why and as you talk why I reacted to certain things why why I felt so disconnected from the world and different and honestly I want to hug you because I'm I've just written down all the things that you've gave him equity you researched his condition, you looked into ways, you went, you know, you went to such great lengths to support the person that you loved in what is a terribly terrifying process. And you believe that finding out what it is wrong, and I use that term very loosely, because I do not believe it's a, it's a, a negative, but you feel like you're wrong, you feel like you don't fit in the world. And to have you find out for him and help him understand it in such a kind and compassionate way, I think I think that's wonderful. I really do. I really think that's wonderful. And for partners of people who are neurodivergent, we're not always met with that level of support. We're not. Um, I've had friends whose husbands just simply won't believe them or think they're making a fuss. And I'm very fortunate that John has reacted exactly like you and he has researched and he, you know, he, he understands probably more about my condition than I do. Um, and I know I'm sort of interjected here, but I really felt that it was important to acknowledge what you did for him because yeah. that was amazing. Thank you. You may continue. <laughs> well, that, I think I think I you know you reflected on it, and he was like, like, you know, how, why? What what made you think? And I told him, and I was like, but if you reflect on the last six months yourself, I said, look at all of the different things that I've done to try and just make your life a little bit easier because it, it also appeals to how I am as a person anyway, like organising things. <laughs> I think so it's, it's the same the with problem. John. He likes to organise. <laughs> so it, it's not as much as of a, a burden as he seemed to think that that it was. Yes. For me, it was actually, it came quite natural and I, I spent the next three years of our relationship doing exactly that and being very aware of what, what he needed, you know, recognizing if we were in a social situation or I knew if we had plans on the night time I would give him the day to himself because you know it mm -hmm. just that's just how it would have to work and that's fine because I was I'm very much I subscribe to the fact that I don't always want to be in my partner's pocket you know alone time or personal pursuits are also really important in a relationship so that wasn't necessarily a problem and then we were we booked a holiday his parents his, his dad lived uh, abroad so we'd booked a holiday to go and see them for the August of the twenty uh, of the twenty fifteen, and then we had in the lead up to it, we had booked originally um, a weekend at Alton Towers. Now this was the year that the Smiler crash happened at Alton Towers. So as soon as that crash had happened, like we rang straight away and was like, "No, I want a refund. We're not coming," which was fine. So then I was like, "Right, let's make." Oh, we used to go out with a, a couple, another couple, like friends of ours, and we used to go out maybe once every six to eight weeks. And I said, well, actually, they had asked if we were free that weekend. Why don't I get back in touch and we'll make those plans? And then all of a sudden, his brother contacted him and said, do you want to go to France? And we'll go and watch the Tour de France. Do you want to come across? We'll take our bikes. And he was like, oh, we're going out with 
we're friends. And I was like, look, I said, they'll understand if we have to cancel, it's not a problem. Um, and he was like, I don't know if I can afford it because we're going on holiday, like literally the week after, like days later when he was due to come home. And it's quite, and I said, look, can we, this was like through the day and I'd said, can we talk about it when I get home? Like, and we'll, we'll have a discussion. And I had spent the afternoon thinking about it. And the one thing about him was like, yes, we were both in teaching. And in the May, I had changed my job from um, like childcare with under fives to actually teaching and delivering the qualifications for the job that I used to do, which gave us more time, but it was still in the private sector. So whereas he got school holidays, I didn't. Ah, yes. And so I came home and I went, look, I went, you need to go to France. I went, you need to go with your brother. I went, he goes, but we can't afford it. I went, I can. I went, so either you pay for France or you pay for your Euros for, for Greece to go to see his dad. I said, or oh, vice versa. I said, I'll, I'll do, I'll pay for one, you pay for the other. I said, but the bottom line is, you know that you'll say if you're at home, when I'm at work and I'm not here, that you're going to go out on the bike every day. And by the time I get home, you'll be so overwhelmed with the other things that are on your brain that you won't ever have gone out on the bike. And then you'll be feeling low and down and that you've missed out on this. If you're in France, you are literally there to cycle. There is nothing else for you to do. Go to France and then, you know, well, all I ask is that you're back by X date because we fly to Greece like two days later, so it gives us time to do like your washing, just make sure we're packed and everything ready to go. And then the week before he left, I had a bit of an incident within my family. Um, my brother attempted to take his own life. Um, oh, God, and so, I'm so sorry. He's he's fine now. He's absolutely fine. You know, thankfully it was unsuccessful. Um, but. In that same moment, I was like, I need to go and see my brother. So on the same day that he left for France, I left to go and see my brother who lives 400 miles away at the time, down in South Wales from, obviously 400 miles from Newcastle. So the the goodbye, I guess, wasn't really, it wasn't, it wasn't what either of us really would have wanted it to be. You know, it was just, uh, look, you, ne- you need to go because you've got booked on a ferry at Dover. I need to go because I need to get, down to Wales straight after work for the weekend just to see if my brother's okay um and off he went and then on the sport room while I was away we managed to get wi-fi he sent me a couple of pictures from the hotel where he was staying the area and then on the Sunday obviously I traveled home from um from Wales and went back to work on the Monday and on the Thursday the day that he died I had gone to his sister-in-law's after work. I'd spoken to him the night before, knew he was having a day on the bike on the Thursday, so the fact that it was half five and I hadn't necessarily, I hadn't heard from him wasn't necessarily a concern for me. It was I knew where he was going to be, I knew what the plan was, I knew he'd message us once he got back to the hotel. So my phone went when I was sat at my sister-in-law's and it was his dad. I wasn't concerned, I wasn't worried because in Greece, things cost, like, things for... Like your tea bags and your paracetamol and your rennies are quite expensive over there so we usually take like a care package so i had like boxes of tea bags in my kitchen and boxes of rennies and all the rest of it so i'm what i'd been obviously dealing with that while he'd been away so i wasn't concerned when he rang and i just went into the kitchen walked out of my of his sister's living room and i stood in the kitchen and i answered the phone and it was his stepmom and she was crying and she went louise i'm so sorry and I knew <clears throat> she didn't need to say, I knew, and I don't remember any of the conversation after that. I just remember screaming. I just remember screaming and his sister coming into the, the kitchen. I put the phone on the side and I just, I sank and sat on the, f- sat on the floor. You just and you know those moments? Like limp. There was moments that tell you when your life flashes before your eyes. <laughs> I literally, I was like, what? Like, and she, then she started screaming. Then her husband came in. Her three children had heard, so they came down. What's going on? And I must, I don't know how long I sat there for, but I just had all of this stuff going through my brain. And then I was like, I need to ring. 
I need to ring somebody, but she still had my phone. I was like, I'm really sorry, but I, I need my phone. I need, I need to phone somebody. I couldn't get hold of my dad. He was out walking the dog. He was, I couldn't get hold of my phones, right? <laughs> yeah. I managed to get hold of my mum, who she rang my granddad. Then he rang his, and I was like, look, I, I know that you want to speak to us, but I, I need to ring people. I need to, can you just wait till I'm, till I ring you? Like, I just need to do something. So then I tech, I messaged the teacher that he worked with to let her know, because obviously it was the school holidays, the summer, the school, nobody, nobody knew. He was off work now for six weeks. And then I just sat and, you know, of all, I've heard, I've heard all of the, like, the, the things that come into your brain, you know, like this morning traveling down, I was listening to Emma Charlesworth podcast that you'd recorded and talking about you know all of the things that come into your brain and the things that you do in that moment and I went oh I meant to be babysitting on Saturday so I just rang the woman and I was like I'm really sorry I can't babysit on Saturday and she started going off at me on th- this was on the Thursday <gasps> about like you've oh this is really short notice this is really inconvenient Louise like what am I supposed to do we've got plans so today couldn't you've given us more notice about this and I was just like your Not partner's really. just telling you. And she went, oh, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. Oh, Louise, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I said, no problem, but you're going to need to find somebody else. I have to go. <laughs> Bye-bye. But and it was just it like. into your mind. I know. I was I like, know. well, I've told her now, so that's fine. I managed to get hold of my dad. He came to my sister-in-law's house and to pick to pick me up. And then we got back to my dad's house. And, you know, when you just start, like, see, you're just on autopilot. It hasn't really sank in. I don't remember crying. I just remembered being in this numb and this cold. Is this, I just remember feeling really cold the whole time. And he took us to my best friend's house because her husband was out and she didn't drive. So me and her had, like, a, a chat and, and everything, and she cuddled us. And then I was like... You know, we we weren't we weren't engaged. We lived in a one bedroom flat. We knew we, our priority was to save up for a house. So, you know, we knew I knew, and we had an understanding this was never going to be a. We knew we were long term, so I, I didn't need a ring. I just, you know, we were yeah. looking to buy a house together. You were young as well. You were only twenty nine, weren't you? Yeah. It's it's not necessarily a priority at twenty nine to get married. No. And so I turned around. I just remember saying to her. You'll do anything to get out get of proposing to me, won't you? <laughs> she just and she went. She didn't know whether to laugh or like or what. She's just stood there when it's okay when I say it. It's fine. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. Like, oh my god! Yeah, we can say whatever we like. God forbid anybody else right. does, though, right? No, exactly. I'm doing the same. I was had friends round, and I was you know we were drinking and crying, and and I just remember going, "Come on, Ben, out you come." jokes over yeah. you know and just kind of making light of it and then just going what the fuck have I done like it's not funny yeah. but now now we understand that dark humor is very much yeah. part of the healing it's definitely and then my dad came and picked me up and took me back to his house and we had so me about a year beforehand me and Andy had had this thing where one morning I'd woke up and I had put toothpaste on his toothbrush ready for him getting up and brushing his teeth and going to work because I got up first and then this, that, i taught gone to work, I totally forgot about it. And then when I got home, he was like, the weirdest thing happened. There was toothpaste on my toothbrush this morning. And I was like, and I, and I still, to this day, cannot tell you where the following came from. But I turned around to him and I went, oh, it must have been the toothpaste brush fairy. Don't know where that came from. Have no idea. And then we just continued this on. Whoever got up first in the morning put toothpaste on the other person's toothbrush and he even we even carried it on when he was in France I've got messages on my phone where we turned around and he said that damn paste toothpaste brush fairy she hasn't been I've had to put toothpaste on my own toothbrush and I was like what we're like 20 we're like 30 years old man you know know, we're going on about stuff like this it's like who are we um and I got back to my dad's house and he said Spare room, you obviously know where the spare room is. There's spare bed and duvets, pillows, whatever. There's a spare toothpaste and toothbrush in the bathroom for you. And that was just like the light bulb moment for me. 
And I just remember, I turned to my dad and I just went, but I went, Who, who's going to put toothpaste on my toothbrush? And he just looked at us like I was an absolute weirdo. And he went, I mean, I can do it if you want, but like you're 29. And I was like, <laughs> and I remember just walking into the toilet, into the bathroom. And I just put the seat, the lid down on the toilet and I just sat there and I just broke, I burst into tears. And I was like, I'm never going to have that again. Nobody's yeah. going to. that. The icing my car was a big one for yeah. me. It was just the moment uh, where, yeah, it just sunk in. And you realise that they're not coming back. And I still get those now, do you, sometimes? Yeah. You'll... Yeah, you would just suddenly, they're not as common and not as frequent, but I'll get this kind of just a flash of, oh, no, I can't tell him. Um, now, mm -hmm. obviously, you know that he's died in, in France, but at this point, have you any idea of what's happened or are you completely in no. the dark? You've just. So when did no. you begin to find out? It was over the next couple of days. So my mum drove straight up from, from Wales the following day to, to be with me. Um, and I then, you know, went, we w were getting bits of different bits of information from his brother. His brother went radio silent for a little while. And we later found out that actually he was being questioned by French, French police for about five hours because they were like, is it sabotage? What's like, what's happened? Because there wasn't a car involved to, at that point. We knew it was just like, it was just him that the, they were like, what, what's happened to somebody like tampered with his bike or whatever and like his brother was like no we were you know it was a few days later that we found out like a bit more information when his brother came home he told us everything the the version of events so they had been coming down off the mountain um and they had a lot of hairpin bends in the area and they'd come around a bend and they used to have bike they would wear bike computers like on their on the wheels to track like speeds and things obviously for like racing and training and his brother's bike computer on the same corner that he came around that he died on took to he took it at 16 miles an hour and his bike computer read 36 miles an hour wow and so it was okay. his brother had come down first sorry i his was brother, just Writing those yeah. those down. So sixteen miles an hour. And did you say thirty six miles? Thirty six. Yeah. So, on a so push, over on a, twice on a the speed. And was he? I mean, was he a reckless man? He. It doesn't no. sound like he was a reckless man. He was the no. safest cyclist of the three of them, which is the most frustrating part. Yeah. <laughs> but this is the thing we with ben. we used to call him Mister Health and Safety. It's funny. Mm -hmm. you, you, that that's not who I recognise. Yeah. No. So he'd come. So his brother had come down first, and then his brother had crossed paths with a woman who was walking up the hill as they were coming down, and they'd kind of almost like bumped into each other. So they'd had sort of a couple of minutes, and like oh, I'm really sorry, you know that. And then she had continued to walk up, and she found Andy in the road, and he was lying opposite her parents' house. She was walking to her parents' house, and then his friend came around the corner, the th the third person they were with. So he got went and got his brother and obviously was like, you know, come back. Um, and then they, she called the ambulance. She was already sat at Andy's side. This woman called the ambulance for him. They came. Um, my understanding is from what they said that when when they're in a French hospital, when there's been an accident and when they're alive, you're not, you, they, they don't encourage you to come in. They tell you to stay away because he's fine. He's what? He's alive. That he wasn't allowed in the hospital, is my understanding from from what I know. So he was alone in the hospital, just with the doctors around him. Um, and then he died at about half past two. Well, I got the phone call at half five, and they had said they'd waited until I was home from work because they wanted me to be safe. They didn't want me to have to drive anywhere after finding out. So his brother and his dad and everything knew earlier on in the afternoon. Um, which how does that I don't make you feel. I 
I, I do a lot of driving. I did a lot of driving for my job at the time. So I was regularly doing sometimes an hour at a time drives to go and meet like learners and people who aren't doing the courses and the apprenticeships that I was doing. They're different like sites and stuff. So in, on the one hand, I can completely understand their concern for me. On the other hand, I also wish I'd known sooner. So it was just for me, you know, it was it was what could I have done what mm -hmm. could I have done to to change anything had I known it half past two he was already nothing. dead nothing but like you I wasn't told until many many hours after Ben had died and I feel very cheated um I feel very angry uh we were advised not to go and look for him anyway when when I got the call but I know that I would have if I I would have needed to be near Dover which is where he died, yeah. and I I couldn't have done anything, but the fact that I was, it felt like they'd hidden it from me. I'd been allowed to go, oh, I've just lost you. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've just lost your video. That's okay. Video we can live without. Um, I just, you, you know, the, the kind of secrecy and the fact that I wasn't kept aware of what happened to my own husband, it felt, it felt like a bit of it had been stolen, you know? Yeah. I think my dad and I had talked and my dad was like, do you want to go across to France? Do you want, do you, we'll go, I'll take you, we'll fly tomorrow. And I was like, what for? I said, I said, if he's alive, if he was alive and you want me to sit by his bedside and, and make sure that he's, he gets better, what, you know, whatever, talk to him to bring him around from some sort of coma. Fair, fair enough. Yes. But he, he's gone. There's nothing I can do. And I was very, I was, I was always very practical about that. You know, I didn't, as soon as I knew, I didn't like, I didn't ring his phone just to double check. You know, there was no disbelief from what they'd said in that respect. I, you know, I, yeah. I, I didn't, it was just, he's gone. What, what do I need to do? This is the base. This is his home. His dad's going to have to travel over from where his dad was living as well. I need to be here because I need to be able to get things from the house if we need them. And then, mm -hmm. I got like a message off his brother and he was like, can you find out about his travel insurance? And I was like, well, he's got it with his bank. And they said, oh, can you sort it out for us? And I was like, yeah, yeah. I said, I'll, well, I'll have a look and I'll see what I've got. And then I rang, I, I rang the bank the following morning. I was I sat in my dad's conservatory and honestly, I'll not name them, but I cannot Oh, I just can't explain how frustrated, upset, annoyed and disappointed I was with his bank for the absolute lack of anything at all. Compassion. I didn't, I, yeah, I didn't ring and ask for any personal information. I didn't, all I wanted to know that he had this particular type of bank account. Did it come with travel insurance? Because that's what he had told me. Because if it did, great, I'll go off and I'll find the documents and we'll get what we need. If not, then we need a plan B. Mm -hmm. And I was on the phone for 90 minutes. I spoke to eight different people and oh we can't we can't give you any personal information. We can't I said I'm not asking for personal information. I just need to know this is the type of account he had. Does he have travel insurance? And I even explained to them what had happened. Oh, we need to take you to the bereavement department. I was like no, you don't. <laughs> you really I just don't. want to have this one question. I can I'm remember just... ringing the um, Ben's life insurance people and just saying, firstly, I don't have a body, which is a fairly difficult conversation to have with life insurance people. They don't, they don't like that. <laughs> um, yeah. But also, I just wanted to find out, before I fought to get access to the money that he had put away for this eventuality, I assume, I, not literally, um, I just needed to know whether scuba diving was covered because it's a high risk yeah. sport and many life insurance or travel insurance policies won't cover um and i had the same thing i just said i don't want to know anything else obviously i have to keep paying the policy because he's not legally dead but i need to know whether it's worth me paying this policy will you pay out yeah you know i'm i have no income and the same as you it took me so many phone calls and um in the end my parents just kind of took over and got to the point where they would hand the phone to me to say i give permission for you to talk but yeah, the, the, 
again, it's uh, and the lovely Emma Gray will talk about this in depth. The, the admin and the resistance yeah. that you're met with your your partner or your husband or your, the person that you love has died, and nobody will even give you these little bits of information no. because repatriation is expensive, right? You know, if, if yeah. she's covered by travel insurance, who's ringing you? <laughs> Line. How retro! In the hotel room. It's not. It's not even my hotel room. So I'm not. Oh, you're in the it. hotel room. It's gone. You... Yeah. It's it's, okay. it's because you can break an answer. Don't worry. <laughs> Sorry. It's not. It's not even for me. It's not even my hotel room because I can't check in yet. It's the uh, it's the membership services manager because I've got because oh. I can't check in. Also. That's kind um, that they've let you do this. This is nice of them. Yeah. So sorry, um, we were just talking so, about the you know the complications of insurance and things, and and just not yeah. really bloody speaking to you. And basically, he he didn't have insurance with the with the bank, so he didn't have travel insurance. Oh no! And to this day, if he was in front of us, I've said I would kill him. Like, I can't believe that you've done this. And we started, I was like, are you joking? Of all the things to not to have, you didn't have travel insurance. You know, when you're just talking to the to the clouds and I'm just like, oh my God. Like, yeah. So I quickly, after, like I say, after eight people in an hour and a half on the phone, once I got the answer, I just hung up and I was like, right. I, I messaged each brother, so we need can be. So we actually, it's pain, we had to then go public and tell people what had happened we had to then share with wider people because I had to crowdfund to pay for his funeral and to yeah. repatriate him home like we didn't have money we didn't have savings we we were the year before he died we'd agreed that we were gonna we'd been to see a mortgage advisor we'd been to see someone in financial advisor and get all of this stuff and we'd said right we're gonna have one last year of splurge and then we're gonna focus on the saving we're going to focus on the mortgage we're going to focus on all of these things so he'd bought like he paid off his debts that year he had bought uh bought his dream car um which was a 17 year old golf but you know uh still it was uh it was his dream car so you know he'd, he'd achieved all of this stuff um you know any money that we had i had about a thousand pound in savings and that was literally which I was using then for holiday spends and stuff. You know, we we we've we lived month to month, um, so we had to crowdfund to bring him home. Funeral costs, repatriation costs. I mean, that's, that's just such an enormous stress, isn't it? And also, it's quite, I guess, quite infantilizing to say, "I need I need to bring my husband home. Please, will you help me pay for it?" Because. Mm -hmm. As human beings, we tend to be proud. We don't like to ask for help, and and what a thing to have to ask for help for. And I hope mm -hmm. people were generous with their contributions and and, and yeah. helped you. But nobody wants to have to do that. It took it took a bit of time, and we got we got enough money, but because of the delays, it took three weeks to get him home, and then another two weeks after that for his funeral so it was about five weeks can after ask, can i ask you and you don't have to answer this but i have no concept of this what what does it cost to have somebody repatriated all together with the funeral cost because he he had to, obviously they have to have a proper a specialized coffin for going in the in the airplane that's going to fly him home then the cost to fly him back because then it's like mm -hmm. they have to have a chaperone with the with the coffin um they have to have a chaperone as well so we have to pay for all of that and then there was i think there was two flights one from two or three flights i think it was from Lyon to paris paris maybe to manchester it's two flights and then a car to drive them up to the local hospital up here to then have a post-mortem because he hadn't had one when he was over there um they hadn't done one at all so all of that had to be done before he could then be taken to the funeral home, before we could then see him or or do anything, and there was a there was a lot of people who, yes. Yeah, so it was 
it was so long and I, I started dipping in and I like every week I went into work for like an hour just to, cause I'd rang work and like, no, it, when I said Andy's died, me, my boss was like, who's Andy? I was like, cause I'd only been there like a matter of months, weeks and months. I hadn't really spent a great deal of time with her. Who's Andy? I was like, my partner. And it was just like, you know, I'd only been there two and a half months when he died. It was just a mess. But I started going into work like for maybe it's an hour once a week because I just thought I don't want to eventually go back into that building and have everybody come and ask us those questions mm. and like and the looks and the faces it's and the, oh, mm. Mm. the Ross, you know, the thing Monica and Richard from Friends. Yeah, I'm okay. Oh, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I just I just I didn't want that. So by showing my head one showing my face like once a week it really it helped me and it helped them as well just to see me and I I just tried to keep busy like in that respect but when he was ready to view I hate saying that but when he was ready in the in the funeral home we could go and see him a lot of people were like are you gonna go and I was like yes and you know I, I need to go and a lot of people, mm. like some of, some of the people like in the family were like, couldn't understand it and said they weren't going to go, which is fine. It's everybody's decision. And I said, the thing is for me, I said, I need to go. I need to see him and I need to understand why he's not coming home to me. I waved him off for a, ho- for a week's holiday. And I need to understand why he's not coming home to me. You know, yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, because I live with the uncertainty and I will always live with the uncertainty Mm -hmm. of what happened. And whilst I very quickly, like you, there's no ambiguity, you know, very as soon as you get that call or the knock at the door, um, I knew that he had gone and he was not coming back. But that I don't have, and again, I really don't like the word closure or sort of acceptance um, has come very difficultly has come very difficultly to me does that make sense because I have never seen him I am certainly wouldn't want to now but his body's no and and so I really understand that you had that need to see that Mm. actually to check that it was your husband you know just yeah and because that's part of the healing process it mustn't have felt like healing right there and then but it is part of the process and it it was it was really difficult like I'd gone I went into the room and I couldn't see him through tears. I was sobbing. I just remember sobbing so much and being so hysterical. And then I came out of the room and I said to them, and I, I don't even know why I said it, but I asked permission to go back in. And the, the funeral director just went, you can go in as many times as you want. Like, please don't ask to go in. I was like, Is, can I only go in once? Or, you know, and I just went back in once I'd had got the initial tears out of the way and I went back in and I saw... You know, they'd they'd put his hair, like, in a really weird way to cover, like, the scar on his forehead. And I moved it back, and I was like, that's not how he had his hair. (laughs) And I've put his hair the way he would have it. And, yes, you could see the scar on his head. And, yes, there were cuts and bruises on his legs. And there were cuts, you know, his thumb had been stitched back together and stuff. And it was not, he was not a pretty picture um, at all. But I looked at him, and I was like, I get it like yeah. the state of him i get it yeah and then Do i you never know went back actually killed him yeah so when uh, i was with his dad when we got the phone call for the postmortem cuz obviously with us not being married um his dad was like next of kin so i was kind of on the peripheral sidelines here you know what, i didn't have much a lot of say in it in anything you know but his dad did, tried to include us and that he was there like i say and He'd hit his, when he'd gone over the handlebars, he'd hit his head, he'd hit his chest and he'd hit his stomach on the handlebars as he'd gone over the bike. And basically, he was, had, he'd fractured a load of ribs, which obviously nobody would know. And when the paramedics did CPR, one of his, they then forced one of his ribs into his heart, which punctured his heart, which ended up ultimately, he would have died anyway, quite likely. But paramedics doing what they had to do accelerated the process so i don't hold any bad feeling or anything obviously i get that's what their their job is to do and they wouldn't know lying on the side of a road what the problem was 
but that's what that's what did it in the end. Ultimately killed him. Oh, the poor guy. And actually, you mentioned there about not being um, married, and um, as an ambassador of Way, you you'll be very aware of the campaign that they've done to ensure that non-married um, couples, particularly with children, are able to access some funding. Now, I don't know whether that affects people without children or not, but... Um, no. No. So you have... Um, often when I'm listening to these stories, what I hear is um, multiple layers of things being stolen. So you initially you have the loss of Andy. That's your... That's your he's been stolen from you, but you've talked to your... your you know, you're quite creating a future together you're saving for a house you're you know possibly thinking of children and and having all these ideas of what your life will look like and then it's all just been stolen away from you um and I it's interesting you say your dad his dad was next of kin when um John went into hospital with COVID thankfully as the paramedics took him in we put me down as his next of kin because he was slightly estranged from his father and and it was very difficult because he was trying to get information um, and you feel like a bit of a second class citizen, like you're not valued as much because you don't have a piece of paper that says you're married. Um, now, I was married yeah. to Ben, but I'm, I wasn't to John when he was poorly. And it's it's so archaic and ridiculous that we have to have this piece of document to say that we are worthy of the name widow or we are worthy of accepting of being the first port of call or accepting life insurance. Um so that must have added a, a huge additional strain on you. Yeah, I think it was it was the fact that as someone who needs a lot of control and had a lot of control over my life, I suddenly was in a free fall of yeah. no control and somebody else having control over my life and the things in it. So the flat that we lived in, was Andy's flat that he had purchased well before we met. So I wasn't on the mortgage. I was I was I didn't have a tenancy agreement. I was just a little you know, even though I paid my way and I did a bank transfer every month of my half of all of the bills, I was I went to Citizens Advice and I asked this question because we had no documentation. And they turned around and they said to me, So what what have you been doing? Have you been like I said, oh, I've had a bank transfer every month, my equal share of all of the bills. I said, it goes to him every month. It's been going for three years. And they went, did he did he pay for anything for you at all? Did he subsidise your lifestyle? And I was like, no. She went, then you're not entitled to anything. I went, I'm sorry, what? And she went, because I, if I could prove that Andy subsidised my lifestyle, I could make a claim from his estate. But because I had been an equal participant in our relationship in the bills, in in life, I was entitled to nothing without, like, without anything. Shocks and, me these days. And then essentially because of the, the housing situation, because there was no tenancy agreement, no formal agreement, his dad could essentially tell me at nine o'clock in the morning that he wanted me out of the house and I would have to be out by six. Like he could, it could literally happen there was nothing to protect me at all. I was absolutely, but I, I was you just lost terrified. in a sea of nothing. You must have I had been nothing. absolutely terrified. And I know that feeling. And it is, you, I, I do a bit of work sometimes um, with companies for returning to work after bereavement. And one of the descriptions is that you have kind of been transported into a different country you don't speak the language mm-hmm. you don't have yeah. a guidebook and you are absolutely terrified and financial insecurity is real and I know many people think the widowed are left well off and well padded with life insurance this is absolutely not the case I know very few people who've had anything and and if they have it's it's not been enough to live on you know it might pay oh. a little bit of the mortgage and you're you're, you've lost your love and you're facing financial, I mean, desperation, I guess, because you've got nowhere to live. And I've just wiped half of my household income off the map. Like, it's just gone. Yeah. Like, half of the income's just gone. Yeah. And it was just, it was just so hard to 
think about what to do next, what what I needed to do. And he didn't have life and in, life insurance. He'd cancelled the insurance on the mortgage the year before, and nobody knows why. So his mortgage wasn't going to get paid for. Yeah, pretty much. And it was just like, ah! like all of these things that you thought, oh, that will not be okay. Well, actually, that, that so that'll give us some breathing space. Actually, there was nothing. There was absolutely nothing. So I had, I'd viewed a flat on the Friday. I signed for it on the Monday. I had his funeral on the Tuesday, and I moved house on the Thursday, and I went back to work on the Friday. Five weeks after Jesus, he died, and it was just. And do you think that helps? Do you think going back helped? I know because John went back to work quite quickly because he felt he needed the um, the routine, and yeah. he felt that it would be quite dangerous for him to be sat at home because Holly would be at school and. Yeah. We know, I know firsthand, many of our tribe know that booze is, is pretty yeah. enticing and he felt that kind of keeping that routine would give him structure and stop yeah. him going off the rails. I did the opposite. But, you know. I I struggled to sleep the first couple of nights. I think the first the first three days I ate half a scone and that's because my mum force fed it to me. And then yeah. I struggled to sleep and then one night my grandmother gave me a glass of wine and I slept the best I'd slept in weeks. And then she offered it to me the next night and I went, and I, I turned around and I went, no, I went because I, I saw the slippery slope that it's, you know, that it's easy yeah. to get down. And, you know. When my, my, when my, when my parents lived with me, my mum's quite, um, my dad was, had a problem with alcohol. He's, he's been sober for 25 years plus. Um, but she's aware and she was very concerned that mm. it would tip me into a drink problem. I, of course, railed against her, you know, and felt she was controlling me and how dare you. But she, for the period of time I took sleeping tablets, which I think was the first month, because like, much like you, I, I couldn't close my eyes because the horror yeah. would just d it, it destroy me. So I was handed my, my sleeping tablet and I was one glass of wine and that was my sort of eight o'clock wine yeah and then go to bed and but as my parents gradually moved out of course one glass of wine is not enough yeah. and I, I had stopped taking sleeping tablets fortunately because that would have been a car crash um but you yeah you need sleep is 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 i i still struggle and i know that a couple of nights without sleeping and the yeah. ship goes down so but yeah, I well done for <laughs> well done for resisting the lure of the, of the red wine. I just went. I I I was so up and down. Like at work, people were watching watching me to make sure that I ate, and I wasn't eating sometimes. And then my so my friends would like take me out for for dinner, and they'd make sure that I ate because they knew I probably wasn't eating at work through the day. And you know, I was I was looking actually at a post the other day on Facebook Memories. Because, like, he died in the July, so now it's, like, only about, what, two months after he died kind of time, you know, yeah. back eight years ago. And some of the memories on Facebook are when my best friends, like, tagged us into a restaurant on Facebook. And, like, my colleagues are co commenting, going, Lucy, make sure she eats. Make sure she eats something. And yeah. it's really, you know, it, you remember, oh, my God, yeah, I, I, barely, I barely ate. And when I did eat, it was a Domino's pizza, maybe it's twice a week. Same, uh, that was, and I was... Yeah, I was, I barely ate. I lived on Pringles and red wine. Um, and I used to have this kind of, it was a long running joke, actually, of my vitamin collection, because I just used to figure, well, if I take enough vitamins, I'll stay alive. And, yeah. and it seems to have worked. But yeah, I and to be honest, I'm still the same. When I go into the snake, as I affectionately hmm, call my, my low moods, um, I don't eat. And I, I realized yesterday that I had stayed in bed and I'd had two glasses of water all day now that's not enough and you can't expect yourself to mentally recover without fuel so i uh, preach the values of kind of meal replacement shakes because i think in that time the act of eating is is, is just you're stuck i can't get food down it just won't but a, a shake i can so that's how i've sort of managed getting nutrition into myself um as i've got a bit older and wiser but yeah, yeah i was you know Pringles or I'd be disgustingly hungover and eat an entire large Domino's and then feel like shit for days yeah. so you your self-care and I talk about 
self-care now but I'm five and a half years in you know in that in those chicken and wine days yeah. self-care is not it's it, it's not a priority for you it isn't you you probably even feel what's the point right yeah I think that's like I mean I'm, I'm it, it was eight years for me in July and I'm still dealing with that because I was when Andy was alive my kind of purpose I guess was looking after him making sure that he was yeah. okay making sure that our lives were curated in such a way that made it easier for him and I never ever stopped to think about me and that's that's what I mean I've, I'm on I'm currently having another round of counseling now eight years later you know this will be my fourth go at counseling for di- and each one's given us different things but I still struggle with that the focus being on me and the self-care yeah you know and over the last few years especially my my lifestyle has really changed in that time. You know, I used to go, <clears throat> when he was out on the bike, I used to go to the gym. I would be in the gym five days, five, six days a week. I was really, you know, I was a size 10 to 12. I am not a size 10 to 12 anymore. Um, Who is these and days? That, well, but, but that element of self-care, and it was for me, because every time I went, every time I went to the gym after I couldn't get through about 15 minutes without bursting into tears which was just which happened a few times on my personal trainer and me and him ended up outside just on the wall just chatting shit you know it's just like rather than working out because I just probably what you needed yeah and like I'm back in therapy now trying to deal with it still because I struggle with the, the permanence I struggle with seeing things you know like what's the point you know I mean my I have a lot of anxieties now when people are away if anybody goes on holiday yes. especially in the early years I sorted their travel insurance out so that it was ironclad and yeah. you know I got really like obsessive over stuff like that Mine and is if people don't answer the phone and um because I lost a, my best friend when I was I, I just left university he died of um sudden adult death syndrome and I was trying to call him and I couldn't get hold of him. And then I was trying to call Ben and I couldn't get hold of him. And it, it leaves you scarred. So mm-hmm. my parents are amazing and they, and, and it's John actually, and they know that if I ring them twice, they got to ring me back. Yeah. <laughs> because in my head, they've had a car crash. And I remember a very yeah. kind friend taking my um, boys. No, my dad had taken the boys bowling to meet a friend. And my dad is useless with his phone. And in my head, I had created this catastrophe that he'd crashed and the boys were dead mm-hmm. and everything was going... My pen is shaking, actually, as I'm saying this, because yeah. you can't believe that <laughs> the worst thing has happened, right? The worst thing yeah. has happened. And what else? Like, what else? Is the sky going to crash down on me? What else? But yeah. I felt very... I felt almost to the point of suicidal. I I was so low and I was so frightened and I so wanted to swap places with him. I felt that, you know, he would have coped better and how did he get to escape this? Whereas I had to stay and deal with it. And of course that has flipped entirely and now I am so grateful that I'm here and I'm here with my, and I'm here to watch those beautiful children that we created grow. But in that time, it was at that point I went to the doctors and sought help because I was really really scared of of my own head and and where it would take me um now you didn't have children and from reading your application I know that you would have liked children and 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 you you and the children gave me purpose they kept Mm. me going I talked to a mum um actually it was just yesterday about Tabby because she was six months old and so there was no grief for her she was just a baby and I was able to lose myself in nappies and feeding and bath times and baby groups. Without that, it, you must find it very difficult to find your purpose. And when I speak to people, and it was just the two of them, I feel so desperately sad for the person left behind because you haven't, you have lost your other half. We were going through fertility treatment at the time, so. I'd known for a long time that I would need support um, if I if I wanted to have children, um, and Andy was really really on board with that. He had no problem with that. We we have a fertility clinic literally in in Newcastle here, um, and we had been for like our our first sort of pre assessments and pre appointments, you know, um, 
before we were going to start the NHS sort of IVF fertility treatment. Um, so we just started that before, in the weeks before he, he died. So I'd gone from almost, you know, I, I knew from being a teenager that I was going to have problems or difficulties. So I kind of almost said to myself, well, you know, you, you, you kind of deal with the fact in your brain then that this might not happen for me. And it's easier to do that than get your hopes up. You know, when you constantly yes. say that, and then all of a sudden, I had this doctor saying, "Well, we'll get you into the fertility clinic, and we can, yes, we can help you. That not be a problem. You'll just need us to, you know, mix it all in a dish or whatever for you, you know, and pick out the right ones." <laughs> um, you know, and 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 that was positive. So I started to, we started to get our hopes up again. We started to to think about that and to be, you know, think about our lives with children, and then when he died I was forced to face you know I'd, I'd got my hopes up I'd done the thing I said I wasn't going to do and I'd got my hopes up and I'd got excited about it and then he was gone yeah yeah and it's another it's, thing stolen right yeah now I know again because I've read your application that you you are in a new relationship I say new relationship you've been together for four years haven't you yeah is that right so yes and how how did you meet him uh i dipped my toe back into online dating so we Different these days isn't it oh, very. <laughs> so, so when so andy died in the july of 2015 my my paternal grandmother died in the january of 2016 um i a friend of mine died in 2017 Another friend died in 2018, and then my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, died in ja January 2019, and I was bereft. I was just I caught every you year. Can say I fucked on here, it's mine. <laughs> you know, you know, I was, I was fucked. You know, really, That's it just, was, it was every bad. year, every year. And I sometimes I, say I feel like that weeble. You know, the weeble that what was yeah. up, and then you just get pushed back down yeah. again and this is you must feel like you've just got your feet on the ground yeah. and smack yeah so January 2019 my granddad died and I, I sat and I was like because I dipped my toe into dating beforehand because my mum I love I love my mum to bits and she just wanted me to be happy she wanted me to be okay she wanted yeah she didn't want me to be alone so I tried dating at about 18 months and I I I remember the person I went on the date with. I was, but I don't remember a word he said because I all I had the whole time was just Andy in my head going, "Really, this guy? What are you doing? Like, yes. Really, this guy? Yeah. What are you doing?" And then yeah. I tried again at at two and a half years, and I still wasn't ready. Like we were, we were together for about a month. We'd gone on the odd date, but you know, it was just that was all it really was. Um, and I was having panic attacks when we were out, and I was like, "This just isn't. I'm not ready." But then, when my grand, when all of these people had died, and this little merry-go-round of death kept coming, and I, I sort of merry-go-round of death. Wow, it, it felt like that. You know, it was just everybody. <laughs> but it and did. Then I, kind of, I kind of stood and I took stock in about the, the February, the March, and I was like, "Okay, so if if." The only people left now above me in the tree are my mum and my dad, who are separated. You know, they're in, you know, my dad's remarried and everything. But if something should happen to my mum, then I am the next responsible adult for four of my, my four younger siblings, my four, my, sorry, my three, I'm one of four, so my, my three younger brothers. I'm, the, the book stops with me. If something happens to my dad, mm -hmm. he doesn't have any other children on his side. So I've got, you know, there isn't anybody else but still I'm like the next responsible adult and I was like I don't want to do this on my own like I don't want to do this anymore and so I went back very gingerly onto <laughs> the dating sites and I got chatting to a couple of people I'd met a couple of people for walks and drinks and stuff um and then I'd gone off for about a month and then I'd come back and about a couple of days later I got a message from this person. Um, he was away at the time down in Norfolk visiting his family. 
I was actually away in Suffolk, the next county over, visiting my friends and going, and going to a gig on my own. Um, so we were talking, we were both really busy and we just didn't really have time that weekend. So we both drove home the same day and then that was on the, the Sunday and then we agreed to meet on the on the Tuesday. Um, and we went out on the Tuesday night and it was... I mean, we got on anyway with a message, but it was just like it was fireworks. It was, it was everything. Like it was, it was so. Obviously, we're still together now. And since I submitted my application to the podcast, we are engaged. Oh, congratulations! Oh, so I he, am so pleased. So he proposed on our four-year anniversary in June. So. Oh, Took that's me given me all the feels over here. How wonderful. Yeah. And I love that you felt the fireworks because I had the fireworks with Ben. He was the most beautiful man I'd ever seen. And, I, you know, our relationship was full of passion and love and, and kindness. And I thought that I'd had my go because you, mm-hmm. know, you see people all around you, right, in terrible relationships. <laughs> and I sort of thought, oh, God, I don't want that. I want that. Yeah. Not in... I went on a date with John. It was, well, it wasn't technically a date. I took him out for um, a really shitty Mexican meal for his birthday and then drunkenly snogged him. But I can remember going to the toilets and texting Lulu and saying to her, Shit, I think I fancy him because I wasn't expecting it. It was, he was my friend and there was a real, he's got a, he's got a, a, a when you meet him, he's kind of aloof, but when you break through the barrier, he's so wonderful and kind. Mm. And yeah, then fireworks happened. And I just remember thinking, I didn't expect this to happen again. Am I allowed to have this again? Mm-hmm. And actually, we are allowed to have this again, aren't we? We are. Yeah. And is he, is he, he's not a widow, I, I take it? No, he's not. Um, so he, he had recently, at the time that we met, he'd recently separated from his wife. And he had a 12 year old. So, yeah. And how did that go? Um, it was all like the first few, the first few weeks were all kind of a bit of a whirlwind. So they had, they had not long separated is my understanding. Um, they had a holiday booked for Croatia in the August, which she then pulled out of, understandably. She doesn't want to go on a family holiday with her ex-husband. Um, and so, he couldn't get anybody to go with him. And so he asked me, after three weeks of dating, do you want to come to Croatia? And I was like, I mean... Why not? I, I was I was, I was, was terrified. And I was just like... <laughs> I bet you were. I, I was like, so much for taking this slow for the both of us. Like, you know, this yep. was... But then I was like, I had like chance to think about it. And I just went, well, hang on a minute. I said, this could be like rather a good experiment because... His, his, his son wouldn't be coming because obviously we hadn't met yet. We'd only been here three weeks. But I'd said, why don't we use it as an experiment? I said, if we let's go enjoy, see Croatia. If we don't get on, then we'll talk it up to just what it was. You know, a nice experience. We'll go our separate ways when we come home. Actually, if we'll get on, maybe this is something and we'll, you know, really get invested into this. And it was the best week ever uh we came home and we landed at the airport as we stood waiting outside for the taxi he rang um he rang his ex-partner and said we've just landed um we're coming over now to the pub if you could come down and bring the son and i was like whoa like we've been together seven weeks i'm about to meet your ex-wife and your child i was like goes is that okay baptism of fire do I have a choice? I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but I just remember sitting in the beer garden and we all four of us were together and I was like, oh. and then all of a sudden him and her went to the bar together and left me with the 12 year old. And I was like, 12 year olds aren't um, known for their conversation. <laughs> not at all. Just, just bothered about the sweets that dad had brought back from his holiday. So, um, but, you know, thankfully, we've, you know, our relationship, my relationship with my stepson is wonderful. Um, oh, you know, if I'm, I'm the child of divorce myself, you know, my, um, 
I, I've been through that. You know, my mum and my dad obviously split up when I was a baby. So there was a lot of to and from for me for, for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously at one point I was moved from Newcastle to South Wales. So I know, you know, it can be difficult not seeing your, pe- your other parent all of the time. So I think we bonded a, a lot over that in the fact that they were separated that I could understand like how he was feeling and how, yeah. you know, things were for him or what, when they ended up moving away to, to Halifax, what what that felt like to not be able to see my my, my dad as often as I want because that was me. Yeah. Um, so actually, I'm really grateful for the relationship that, that me and him have. Um, and it's tough all of a sudden going from having no children to having essentially a teenager in the teenager. house because it was his birthday within a couple of weeks of that. Um, you know, and he's just absolutely smashed his GCSEs recently and just started college. And I am so proud of Isn't the you know, the young man that he's turning into. It's so privileged. Yeah, I obviously, like. I'm a stepmother too. And I f- had a conversation with um, Hector actually about, because uh, I think I must have said to him something about how wonderful my children are because I like to tell him, you know. And he went, so you gave birth to me and Monty and Tabby, but you didn't give birth to Holly. And I said, no, I didn't. Her mother, her mummy gave birth to her Mm. and she will always be her mother. But I'm raising her as my own. I've raised her now since she was six. She's 10 now. And so I take pride in her achievements. I care deeply about her well-being. I love her like I love my other children. It's step parenting is complicated, I think, perhaps more so when there uh, is a, another parent involved, whereas not that you'd wish their parent to be dead, but we don't have that kind of conflict. Yeah. yeah. My friend. Um, and it's it's not something I ever expected to be as a stepmother. I didn't yeah. see that in my future. And it's one of the biggest gifts I've been given in this journey. I had so much stolen from me and so much taken from me, and so did my children. And actually what I have gained is a daughter that I, you know, I I would have loved to have four children. And I love the fact that my sibling, my, sorry, my children have gained a sibling. Um, Mm. Her and and uh, uh, Tabby are, you know, I mean, they're two girls. It's, it's, it can go either way, but the fundamentals are there and the love is there. And just because a child is not biologically yours, it does not mean that you don't have the same love and, and care for them. Um, But I have to say, navigating a 12 year old is probably very different to navigating a six year old um lots of my friends who are starting to date now are finding their teenagers are less enthusiastic (laughs) yeah I think so like my partner and I we had discussed like the potential of having a child together but Mm -hmm. there, there are some issues on the NHS with the fact that he already has a child and I'm therefore not entitled to, we're not entitled to fund him, we'd have to pay for it. And we sort of sat down and had had a really tough conversation, maybe it was about 18 months ago, and it was like, no, we're definitely not going to try because of the, the odds are already quite low because of my own conditions. Then you're thinking about, you know, having to save up and spend all of that money and the fact that it might not work and you could spend all this money, have your mental health really badly affected and be in the same position that you were. And I don't want to do that. And my yeah. stepson, when we were talking about it, he went, a, ma- a man, because I had, I, I'd said, I'd used the phrase, I, at the very beginning when we first met, before I'd even met my stepson, was, I, I, I don't know if he'll be enough. And he's used that. Mm raised to me before am I not enough when we talked about having a child together and you know my partner's quite open with his son about it and he's going am I not enough and but he he was he said it in like a concerned way like inquisitive concerned way like you know not as if not not angry or upset or anything it was just yeah 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 you know and I said no it's not you are I said but I've also never had that. I came into your life when you were 12, almost 13. I said, I've never had that experience of, you know, I got, I didn't get the newborn experience and the toddler experience mm. and the school experience, the school experience with, you know, I, I've never had that. I said, and that's something that we've thought about 
but ultimately we've decided not to do. And it, yeah. it is it's yeah. difficult. And it is that's a really difficult decision. Um because yeah, you, again you have had you've been cheated of, of that, of those opportunities and you know, I, I the school run is overrated <laughs> unless you found a wonderful tribe like I have at school they're amazing um but yeah it's to, to let go of of a dream or a plan or an expectation of what your life is going to look like um it is huge and yes your stepson will be enough he will and hopefully will give you grandchildren and you'll get to see the babies and but you're right it's we expect to be able to have children. We spend most of our formative, you know, sexually active years desperately trying not to have children. Yeah. And then as soon as we actually want to, often there are complications. And, of course, people are having children later and, and, and things like that. And I think it's a brave decision to decide not to pursue it because you have managed to find yourself happiness, haven't you? And yeah. you've managed to find yourself a place of safety and you would be putting yourself through such a lot of heartache potentially. Um, and it, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is, I, it is a really, really tough decision and I'm sorry that you've had to make it. I think for us, we, as part of that decision was also thinking and reflecting on the age of my stepson now He's at the age, you know, he's, mm. he's 17 next month. He's going to be off doing his own thing he doesn't want to to spend time with us and me me and his dad you know our lives can we can do so much we can you know we've just we've literally just come home from New York just the two of us for a two-week holiday for my partner's 40th birthday and it was just a wonderful you know it was amazing but then last year we had a holiday with my stepson next year we're having a holiday with my stepson you know so we're in he had a holiday with his mom this year which is why we went away so we yeah. just had like so you our get time. The best of both. Yeah. And we can have those adventures and that aren't gonna have like, you know, a nappy bag dragon with us, you know, around these lovely yeah. places that we want to go on holiday and and all the rest of it. You know, there's there's pros and cons to it. The, you know, and the, I'm trying to absolutely focus on the boat. There absolutely are. And you know, we look at holidays and the six of us and yeah. the, the cost of these holidays is just, you know absolutely insane um and uh, john and i try and get away once a year if we can just for i think the most we've managed is three nights which was our honeymoon um but i've just booked uh three nights in amsterdam for us in october because neither of us really wanted to fly like we've flown this is really arseholy to say but i've three holidays and i find traveling quite stressful um i find the airport process quite stressful and i just why don't we go on the train and just because we can get on the train have a book have some lunch you know and then arrive in amsterdam we've got three nights and hopefully we will come back refreshed revitalized and ready to parent because i find for us um we need it we because the way we work we both work for ourselves so we are in the house most yeah. of the time and um I have the studio in the garden where I can escape thankfully uh but we're with our children we pick them up every day we would and much as I love them and I love being part of this unit I look forward to the time where I can go oh we can go to two weeks to the Caribbean like we haven't got to try and cram three nights in while we've got the child care yeah. and I know that it's naughty to wish it away but like you say there's pros and cons yeah definitely so, well, it has been an absolute pleasure to hear your story. And I really didn't expect you to tell me that you were engaged. And that's really, really put a smile on my face. And I think it will for our listeners when they hear back. Because let's be honest, we all have a little bit of romance. And just to, you are at the way, you're at the way general meeting at the moment. Is that yep. what you're, what you're yep. doing? Yeah. In Bristol, did you say? Yes. Yep. Bristol. Well, you have a wonderful time and you pass on my love and best wishes to all of way who i hold in enormously high regard and credit with probably keeping me sane um in those early days of my grief so what you're doing and what you continue to do through that charity are saving lives and um helping people rebuild their lives so on behalf of myself and and i imagine many of our listeners thank you um but for now 
you just keep doing what you're doing my darling keep going on your holidays and celebrating life and keeping that memory of your partner with you whilst also embracing a new life and yeah. that's kind of what we do right yeah it's what we have to do yeah it is and it's a it's something i say quite a lot but you 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 make a choice you make a choice and nobody's going to pull you out of that pit you have to do it so you have a wonderful time. Is this is this like a, do you all get drunk and dressed up? I've not been to one. Is it going to be fun? Yeah, so it's kind of like the the Saturday is the, the general meeting. And actually when, you know, you hear about the, we talk about the charity and like what we've been up to and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, have all of that discussion. We've got a few breakout sessions in the afternoon. So I'm doing cider tasting and wa- mindful watercolour tomorrow afternoon. And then it's like Ooh, a big... Mindful watercolour. And then it's a big party tomorrow night and you can be as dressy or as, you know, casual as you want. Um, I tend to go to the extremes of dressy and I get like, I, I make a big thing out of every year, get like a really nice, get a really nice dress and get all dressed up and everything. And- I'm going to a ball tonight and I'm still waiting for the delivery of two dresses to arrive. So um, I do like a last minute panic, <laughs> um, but I'm with you. If you're going to, if you're going to go for it, go for it. And I wore a, quite a fancy dress on the school run yesterday, which was a stark comparison to the, the track suits of usual. And I just thought, but if I don't wear this dress, what, what am I going to do with it? Decorate my bedroom yeah. with it? Sod it. Mm-hmm. We wear, wear, wear a fancy frock. You go for it. And I'm, I hope you'll send me pictures. Yeah, I will do. And so once again, thank you so much for bravely sharing your story and coming on and talking to me. Um, I am eternally grateful to the people that have the the courage to do this. And I wish you love and healing. And please do stay in touch, darling. Take care. Thank you. And for everybody else out there listening, you take care of yourselves too. I will be back on Friday with Mr. GM and we will have a chat about today's episode and... uh, probably whatever else has come up in our world this week but for now lots of love and we'll speak soon